Um, I um, noticed a question someone had asked on the internet, and it said, uh, hey man, got a question. If babies don't have guilt imputed onto them, why did God let them drown through the flood? If they were innocent, wouldn't letting them die be outside of God nature? Um, and um, so I want to address that one. Um, it wasn't directed to me. I just saw it asked of somebody else. Um, God does not just, uh, he doesn't allow people to die. What happened was when Adam uh, sinned, Adam and Eve sinned, we didn't inherit like sin from Adam, like the guilt of the sin from Adam. What we inherited was the death. The death and the Bible says death reigned from Adam to Moses okay so when Adam sinned he opened up corruption really was what it is and so what we see in this world right now is everything corrupts you know it's called the second law of thermodynamics you know and uh, well, I don't know if that's really I'm not a scientist so I shouldn't probably say that but it's related to that because everything kind of breaks down I think that's the second law of thermodynamics but um, so, um, you know, we see that, we observe that in nature, everything's kind of breaking down, nothing's being held together. And I don't think that was the way it always was. I think that when God created the earth, everything was like perfect and ran and was going to keep going on and on and on. But ever since Adam, God saw, it says in Genesis, God saw that if man continued to live forever, <clears throat> if man continued to live forever, because their hearts were evil, they would just, well, he said they'd, be, they'd become like gods. In other words, they would just do their own thing, you know. And so that's what men are doing, is they're kind of doing their own thing. That's the way I kind of look at it. And um, so because of that, he made it so that they couldn't eat from the tree of life. And so ever since then, people would eventually corrupt and die. That tree of life would keep them from corrupting, but they... Um, now they now everybody just dies and it's corruption it's basically you know when you get older you start getting you can't really see my gray hairs that well but i let me just show you my gray hairs i, I have a few of them man you know this really it compliments me um it looks like blonde in this camera but it's gray those little blonde hairs up here are gray but um <laughs> you know, i have gray hair on my eyebrow real bad so you know that's because of adam that's because of adam and so, but it's not a judgment of God onto me. It's just simply because of the state that Adam is in and everybody that was born. This flesh came from this corrupt flesh. So the corrupt flesh begats corrupt flesh. This flesh is no doubt corrupt, okay? Now, just because the flesh is corrupt, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to sin. Now, if you don't have the spirit, if you're not born again, you're kind of um, uh, in a situation where... Um, you could go without sinning if you have the understanding, but the thing is, this, the, without the spirit, you're kind of like blind, you know. So anyway, I'm kind of getting off on a segue. But the bottom line is this: it's not the the it's not sin nature necessarily, or it's not the punishment of sin that we inherit. It's the sin, if you want to call it sin nature, that may be correct. But the thing is, when you become a Christian, when you become truly born again. Even though you may not realize that you don't have sin nature, that's what you need to take hold of. That take hold of that truth, and that has to do with the cross. See, this whole death thing has to do with the cross because what Jesus did was, in effect, and I'm kind of paraphrasing this, is when he put himself to death in the form of his flesh. When he did that, what he was doing was basically putting our what you call the sin nature. To death the old man is passed away and so in Romans it says you know um, consider yourself dead to sin because Christ he said when you're you know Christ died on the cross um, you're dead with Christ on the cross and, and um, it's uh, another part says um, that he took upon himself the form of sinful flesh to put away sin to put sin to death so that's why Jesus came to this world was to put away that sin. In other words, he kind of the way I look at it is he proved to us through like an example, and he proved it to the spiritual darkness to Satan. He basically defeated Satan and he defeated death 
on the cross by showing that it had no power over him. He completely controlled, that's, that's like self-control, He had where he did not let the flesh determine what he was going to do. He let it die. And, and that, that was to give us an example of how to live. So this whole thing with um, this backwards idea that, okay, because Adam sinned, we're all kind of getting punished by God. And even if you're a baby, you still get punished for something you didn't do. And that, uh, I mean, in a way, it is a punishment for something you do in the sense that we face the consequences of what Adam did. But each baby is born innocent. And it's evident to you that they're born innocent because as a person gets older, they do um, they do things that they know are wrong. Whereas a baby, they don't know what they're doing is wrong when they when they scream and cry and all that stuff. Now they learn very quickly, but at first they don't understand what's going on. They have to learn how to be mature. Okay, and during this process of you maturing and becoming an adult, the adult makes starts to be able to have this idea understanding of what's right and wrong and then that's like what Adam and Eve they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil and when they did that they knew the difference between right and wrong but instead they chose to sin instead of doing good and so that's what happened when you gain knowledge is that you make decisions and so as you get older you make decisions and you do what is wrong even though you know that it's good that it, you shouldn't do it and so God doesn't really hold it against you in, in the sense that uh, that when you sin, he doesn't just say, "Okay, you're going to go to hell right away." He he knows that we're that we're that it's because of the flesh, because of the corruptness of the flesh. It's called the infirmities of the flesh that we sin, and so that's God's grace and mercy. Then also the fact that, he, that we don't have the knowledge of Jesus Christ, and we don't have the maturity in Christ. You know, this uh, go on further than just carnal uh, maturity, and so. That's God's grace that he doesn't just strike us dead right away when, when we sin. So what he does is he, instead of just making this current body that we're in survive forever, what he does is he transforms us into a new creature. And on the resurrection, we actually become in a resurrected body that's not a, a mortal body. This mortal body will pass away that I have right now. And that's not a punishment from God because I have eternal, eternal life. Okay, So it, when I die... That's not a problem. Now, the current suffering that we're going through is problematic. The temptations we go through are problematic. So that means we're in danger. We're in a, in a, a risky situation right now because the devil still knows he can use that flesh against you to tempt you and things like that. Now, if you have faith in Christ, that can overcome that. He'll provide a way for you to escape that temptation. But the thing is that... People still go, ah, you know, I still want to sin. And there's many things in life that we have to learn learn to overcome. And so it's discouraging sometimes and things like that. So you need to keep trusting in God and keeping your chin up and not looking down and looking, oh, you know, God's so mean. You know, that's what the devil's trying to tell you that God's mean and, you know, and you start complaining and grumbling. And when you do that, then that's when you start, you, that's when you fall. You know, but don't do that. Keep continuing in the faith. And so it's when you're a baby, you're innocent. You're not dead. You're not, you're destined to be, you know, um, you're destined to be, um, what do you call it, a sinner. You know what I mean? In the sense that every man has sinned since Adam. You know, that's almost a given that you're going to sin. But it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. It's possible for someone to go without sinning, and Jesus is proof of that. And people go, wait a second, but he's God. When you say, but he's God, but Jesus is God, what you're doing is you're saying, what he did on the cross has no impact on my life. You see, that's not true. What Jesus did, the way he lived, has an impact on you because it says in Scripture that he was tempted but did not sin. And people, when I tell people that, they go, oh, but you're saying he's a sinner. No, I just not told you he didn't sin. See, that's the thing. A Christian can go and they can be tempted. But they don't sin. They can have trials and temptations, but they don't have to sin. And the Bible promises that. It's just a matter of faith to be able to believe that and to take it. And that's how I used to think. When temptation would come along, I would just latch right onto it because I felt that I was just bound to it. And there's nothing I could do but just sin. And now sometimes the things that were really bad things, you know, like cheating, stealing, you know, 
things I wasn't used to doing all the time. You know, I didn't go rob banks all the time, but maybe there might have been a situation where I was with somebody that, that shoplifted or, you know, I was around kind of people like that that were crooks, you know, and they would cheat and do all kinds of stuff like that. And I was tempted a couple times. In fact, I bought things, you know, that I probably shouldn't have bought, you know, but um, statute of limitation, I think, it was a long time ago. But, <laughs> you know, it's, you know, I was tempted. You know, to go and help them out with their little shenanigans and, and, and you know, so, um, but when those things came along, those are things that, that I knew I didn't have to do that. And so it's like, okay, I ain't going to do that. But there's other things that I've been doing since I was a child, you know, that I just felt that I had to do. I was just in bondage to that. And I just had to do those things. And, and I was like, this is not victory in Christ. Where does it say? It says in the Bible that. I'm a new creature in Christ. How come I don't feel like it? How come I just feel like a defeated sinner? And I just couldn't understand that. And so I was just like, well, then either Christianity is just baloney and this Bible is just a lie or just some really different people than me. Like back in the long, long time ago, maybe they were made up of something different than what we were made up. Maybe we've evolved, a D, you know, like Devo. You know, maybe we've devolved or something. I don't know. I just started to lose my faith. You know, I was like, I just can't believe this anymore because I can't live it. And so I started to kind of just have doubts. But then I started to say, think, well, you know, let me read the scriptures and try to find out what it actually is trying to tell me. And that's what I started to see about the cross and how Jesus was tempted but didn't sin. I went, aha, Jesus, he was actually flesh like me, even though he had the Holy Spirit. Yes, but guess what? We're Christians. We have Christ in us, the hope of glory. So if we've got Christ in us, then we can be like him. I went, bingo. So I said, then why, don't, why can't I just overcome that? I said, because I don't believe. I keep having these doubts. See, Satan was using my temptations to show me, hey, look at you. You're a sinner. You can't help it. See, he was, he was defeating me. And, and I was lacking faith. And I said, I need to stand on that promise. I said, Lord, I don't understand this. But I do think that you got a good point there that your son did not sin and that but he still had flesh like me and i know he had the holy spirit but you've given me a measure of the holy spirit not as much as you know jesus has but you've given me a measure of the holy spirit then so i know that if that's true then he's given me enough see that's a seal a promise of the holy spirit that can we we can walk godly okay so he's given us enough of the holy spirit to overcome sin it's just a matter of us taking that little seed that he's given us and building that up. So I had this little, tiny, teensy little seed. And today it still seems like such a little seed of faith. I mean, I just am ashamed at so many doubts I have. But the thing is, I had that little seed. And I said, you know what, God, I'm going to take that little seed you gave me, and I'm going to apply it. I said, I don't have to do this. And so when I go along in my temptations, I keep thinking to myself, I don't have to do that. I'm a Christian. I belong to Jesus. I belong to God. I'm a child of God. A child of God doesn't have to sin. And Satan, just after a while, he saw that he couldn't control me anymore. You know, the enemy couldn't just get me to stumble anymore. That wasn't perfect all the time, you know, at first. You know, and so, but, you know, I still understood things. But the thing was, is um, I kind of, this kind of going off in another topic, but I have another video about that called How to Stop Sinning. And, but, this touches on this really important concept was that many people will continue to watch television and continue to uh, hang around with non-Christians or continue to hang around carnal Christians and continue to do things that other Christians do, watch the same things. And that is not the way. That is not the way, my friend. Jesus said this. He said, if your eye causes it offends you, pluck it out. And cast it away because it's better to go around with no eye than to have your whole body be cast into hell. And when he said that, he was not exaggerating, okay? Now, obviously, he's not talking about, okay, you should actually pluck your, pluck your eye out. If that was the case, I would have to pluck both of my eyes out because they were causing me to sin. But I understood the meaning of what he was saying. The meaning of what he was saying was you don't go around and put yourself in situations where you know you're going to be tempted. Go watch filthy movies and go hang out on the beach looking at girls in bikinis and go, <laughs> you know, and, and do all those things and then just go, well, you know, it's not my fault. My eye caused me to be offended. No, he said do whatever you have to do to get away from that. So, you know, don't 
you know, if anything in your, causes you to start lusting that you're watching on TV or Internet or anything like that, you have to get away from it. You have to push the close button or turn off the TV, change the channel, or even just get rid of your television set. I mean, I just got rid of my TV altogether. I said, mm, I don't need this here. I'll sell it for 20 bucks. No, I'd rather not go to hell. Thank you. You know what I mean? It's just that simple. It's like, what do you want, television or hell? Well, hmm, I think I'll take television. I mean, I mean what do you want, uh, television and hell or heaven? That's what I'm trying to say. I messed up. You know, and I'm, I'm like, wait a second. I, I don't want tel television in to make me go to hell, so I'm just going to get rid of it. You know, now it might not be your personal thing to do that. You might not need to do that. You know, women don't have that problem. Men don't. But my personal pit problem was that with the eye, you know. And um, but the thing is, if you cause another brother to stumble, you're guilty of the same thing that your brother did. So if you watching bad stuff on TV and you think it's okay and you just think your your holiness friend is such a religious um, you know fanatic because he doesn't want to watch your filth on your television, you're accursed. You know, so don't just take this lightly. You should really stay away from that because if you you know if you cause another Christian to sin, you're going to be guilty of that. And that's what it says in the scripture. It says yes, you have the freedom to drink alcohol, but guess what? If you're drinking alcohol and somebody else is an alcoholic, a recovering alcoholic, and they see that you're drinking, they go, it's okay to drink. And then they go on a binge and they just, oh, you know, and then they go back into their sin because you just happen to be drinking a beer and you felt you're so free to drink that one beer. And then this other guy comes and you, know, let me put in this situation. You're a Christian, you feel like you're free to drink a beer, right? And you're sitting there and you're going, oh, I'm so holy, I, I don't have to worry about alcohol, right? And then your your friend comes over. Then he sees you drink and he goes, oh, I'm sorry, i got to go. And you go, why? I don't want to be around alcohol. And you go, oh, you're such a jerk. You know, don't you, aren't you strong? You know, can't you handle that? You know, it's like, you know, are, you're such a fanatic. The Bible says you can drink alcohol. He says, well, that's not for me. You know, I'm out of here. I don't want to do with it. Well, you're causing a man to stumble. <laughs> you're working for the devil, my friend, if you do that. And so I know people argue, oh, alcohol sin, alcohol's not. No, alcohol in itself is not a sin. However, causing another man who has a weakness with alcohol to sin is definitely sin, and it's definitely damnation, okay? Now, there's now you might be thinking, oh, there's many Christians out there that do this all the time. That means nobody would be saved. Well, guess what? That's what Jesus said uh, when he was talking about marriage. He said that you should just marry one person and that's not that's it don't get divorced and everybody said but that's too hard nobody can do that and Jesus said just a few people are going to hear what I'm saying Jesus said the way is narrow you know in other words Jesus said a few people are going to hear that you really should, it's not a good idea to get married you're permitted to get married but he's saying watch out because you're stuck with that wife the rest of your life now I'm not you know I'm, I'm talking about you know there is exceptions to that but I'm saying is that you're supposed to be committed to that. When you when you say those vows, you're supposed to stand by those vows that you say. You're not supposed to go against them. And so um, it says, "Till death do we part." And you should what, your yea should be yea, your nay should yea. If you can't swear that, if you can't live by what you swear, then don't swear it. Just say every day I promise to be with you or whatever, because that will be held against you. So um, anyway, uh, that's pretty much it. You know. Uh, the way is really narrow, and so what you have to do, there's different steps to under, gaining understanding. One is fear, and, and what I mean by fear is this. Do you value salvation? You know that the result of not being saved is hell, and the revol, vol, 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 result of being saved is heaven. Okay? Do you really value that more than your life? That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, he who loses his life for my sake will gain eternal life, right? So that's what this is up against, is what value does it? Let's measure how much you value it. And if you see that you're falling short of that, you're saying, wait a second, I'm not ready to die for what I believe in, then you're falling short, and you need to recognize that. And if you're falling short, then you should fear, because Jesus warns about that and says, if you want to save your life for the sake of saving your life, then you'll lose eternal life. And so he's warning you about that. And so you need to uh, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So you need to examine yourself and ask Jesus to show you all the errors that you have 
Study the scripture carefully, not according to Pastor so-and-so or Pope so-and-so or what you saw on TV or some video or book you read, but what the Lord's showing you through scripture. And you're going to be challenged. It's going to say things that don't match up with what you've been taught. I guarantee you that. And that's why so few people see it, because they don't want to believe that they have to um, endure through tribulations and trials and all those things. But that's the cost. Jesus said, count the cost. And so when you, when you want to become a, his disciple, and by the way, there's no such thing as just a believer versus a disciple. Jesus said, go into the world and make disciples of all men, not believers. Not believer, make believers of some men and disciples of others. So there, you have to be a disciple of Christ, you know, and take up your cross daily. The, the thing is, it's, it sounds hard, but it's not hard in the sense that you don't have any help. You've got help from God. Believe me, of all people, I am the last person to think that I ever, ever have this kind of hope that I've got. But somehow God just, the way it worked out was just, I was so messed up that that was the only option I had was to turn to him. And so after I turned to him, then he started to show me the truth about what was going on in my life and all the stuff I was doing and that was wrong and how he was not happy with me. And to this day, he still shows me these things. He goes, look, man, you're not being obedient. You're not being obedient. Um, I'm not going to continue with you if you just decide that you're going to do that. See, he knows our heart. He knows if we want to continue. So you've got to keep examining yourself and go, okay, I see. I see it. You know, I get it. I'm really stubborn. You know, I need to continue to grow. Hard way, but in few will take it. And it may not sound like a message of hope like you've been hearing, but it is a message of great hope because there's great reward. And you are with, you do have help. And the way of God is so much better. I mean, you know, Jesus, you know, he was resurrected and God made him Lord. So that's proof to us that God will fulfill that. If you come to him and repent, he will reward that and he'll show you the way. Don't trust in yourself, but trust your, trust in God. And then when I say don't trust in yourself, what I'm saying is don't look at yourself and go, oh, man, but look at me. I'm just this nobody. You know, I'm just this weak person. Paul was weak, too. Many Christians were weak, but God made them strong. So um, you're not born with this sin, dead sin uh, from Adam and that you, you have to sin. You don't have any sin nature. If you're truly a Christian, you don't have to have this old sin nature. The old man is gone. You have a new creature. I have no idea why people say you have sin nature when you're a Christian, when the Bible clearly says that we're a new creature in Christ, doesn't it? 